I am Docatella, and every day I take a little scuba dive into the delirium aquarium of the public hospital that I work at in Johannesburg. In my fourth year of medical school, I was tasked with taking blood from a patient who'd had a heart attack or something similar, and I managed to poke and prod the guy so much that I fainted next to his bedside and came to kind of dangling from his bed. And when I really came to, I was in the casualty bay being resuscitated by my own colleagues. At that stage, my colleague asked if I wouldn't perhaps consider another career, which, looking back, perhaps I should have. South Africa's medical program is structured in six years. You start off in your first year, a small fish in a big pond. You go through to fourth year, where you start interacting with patients and are unleashed onto them. And by sixth year, you're a slightly bigger fish in a slightly smaller pond. You graduate, and now you're a doctor. Mercedes wants to sell you a car, banks want to give you a bank loan, the future looks very bright, and you are now the Dogatellas of the country, so to speak. Dogatella Zulu for doctor. No one tells you at that stage, though, how lonely it can be standing in an eight-hour surgery, for example, how much blood is actually involved in doing medicine, and how harsh it can be, hammering away at people's bones, drilling into their heads. It's very gruesome and certainly very visceral on a day-to-day -day basis. You soon realize as a, as a medical doctor that you don't really need to be that smart, nor do you need to be that patient or kind, but you certainly need to have endurance, stamina, no affinity to sleep whatsoever, a mildly neurotic personality, and probably some narcissistic uh, or uh, sadomasochistic tendencies within you. That is most certainly evidenced in your first 36-hour call, if not before then, where you are likely to be spat on, coughed on, passed on, bled on. Um, and I started wearing Wellington boots to my call after, after the first one, where my socks were soaked with who knows what. You are faced, as I've said, with very visceral scenarios. And an example here is this baby who was suffering from hydrocephalus, who four hours after I took this photo actually died, not because I didn't resuscitate him, but because there was no oxygen cylinder available in the hospital for me to do so. This gentleman had had pins put into his leg about eight months before I took the picture. And I removed the pins along with about five maggots. And that's what you can see just next to the pin in the photograph. When you go to get some nice reprieve from the chaos of the hospital, what greets you is certainly not the nice Grey's Anatomy well-lit room with a hunky doctor on the top bunk, <laughs> but this rather disheveled uh, room with unwashed sheets in it. And then you're called to see a baby who's four months old with multi-drug-resistant TB who has to spend six months in an isolation cubicle. The scope of things that we see as young doctors in this country, or doctors in general, is very, very heart-wrenching. Fetuses abandoned in casualty with no one to claim them, removing butternuts from men's bottoms as they fell on them, <laughs> and all range of things that are both comical and also incredibly devastating, as, as dogatellas, so to speak, in the country. So one asks, how do you cope? How do you get through every day trying to be patient, trying to be the kind doctor that everyone expects you to be? I had an idea one day, as I took blood from a patient with leukemia, for the umpteenth time, and he told me the next day was his 18th birthday and he'd be spending it in hospital. So I baked him a cupcake, and I baked cupcakes for the whole ward, including the staff and the nurses. And for that day, everything was just that little bit better. I started letting patients use my cell phone to call friends and family when, because they were distressed. I let kids play with my stethoscope. I wore brightly colored scrubs to work. I tried to make every interaction just a little bit better and not to fa face patients with impatience, so to speak, that comes with being so overworked and understaffed and under-resourced. I developed what I'd like to call my felicity suit. Felicity meaning a state of happiness. And it's really a coat of armor that is love, joy, and happiness that I try to wear every day to keep up this positive um, energy that I, that I try to, to maintain within the hospital. Some of the qualities of my Felicity suit are certainly durable fibers to face that constant barrage of pain and despair that I, I encounter in the hospitals. A blubber-like emotional coating certainly helps, and it needs to be body fluid splash proof. <laughs> Included as well as some blissful ignorance, which, which isn't what you'd expect from your doctor, but it's certainly necessary, and a determination for happiness. 
a more practical quality as non-sweat underarm patches after your 36th hour in the same outfit. My Felicity suit is perhaps not what one needs. You need more of a coat of armor facing South African casualty situations. But it's something I found that has improved my quality of life and perhaps those individuals who I've interacted with day in and day out and at, at 2 a.m. in the morning. The design's not perfect, but I'm working on it. Thank you.